Okay, three, two, one. Oh! You know, one would think that I would be happy if I could actually start a video without saying the words strange eBay purchase, but you know, that's only true if my current project isn't related to a purchase my friend Cyrusel made through Goodwill Auctions. <sighs> it's pretty clear to me now that certain people like seeing me in paint, and it's a very apt summary of how 35 pounds of vintage hardware have ended up in my collection. Or well, I guess it's more accurate to say it's under joint custody. Anyway, this is your host and commander, and it's time to resurrect the machine that broke the IBM PC monopoly, the Compact Portable 1. When this package arrived a few weeks ago, past me was completely unaware of the amount of pain and suffering he was getting into as we unboxed the Compact for the first time in the back of Sierra Cell's car. I will note that this is the same friend who left the Lovecraftian horror that was the Intel professional workstation on my doorstep, so I should have known better than to let him mail it to my post box. The Goodwill auction only had a few pictures and listed the system in unknown condition, so simply seeing things like the disk drives and CRT were present was a good sign to say the least. What makes the Compact Portable so fascinating was that it was the first PC-compatible clone computer, and a bit more context is needed to understand the significance of that. When IBM made the PC-5150, they essentially used off-the-shelf components from Intel and other manufacturers. The only custom parts were copyrighted IBM ROMs and the Microsoft licensed Cassette Basic. As such, it wasn't hard to make a machine that was hardware compatible with the 5150. This led to the creation of machines that ran DAWs but were not PCs, like Adrian Black's HP 150, which ran MS DAWs 2.1. In theory, it is possible to write applications that were hardware independent, but that's easier said than done due to the limitations of the DAWs programming API. However, since Microsoft was willing to license both DAWs and BASIC to any interested party, the only real blocker in creating a PC-compatible system was making a replacement for IBM's BIOS. That's where Compact entered the picture. By reverse engineering the 5150's BIOS, Compact was able to create a fully compatible replacement. This led to the birth of the Compact Portable 1 and the start of the PC Clone Wars. We'll put the Compact BIOS through its paces in good time, but let's go through what's actually here. We've already seen the 9-inch monochrome CRT and the two full-height double-density disk drives. On the side, we have a panel that reveals five ISA card slots. We're going to pull these out once we get inside the case, but just from a glance, we can see a parallel port card, CGA card, and a modem, as well as an empty spot. That gap wasn't empty when we first got the machine. It originally contained a hard card which we pulled out and then decided to test on the Intel Professional Workstation. I unfortunately did not take footage of pulling out the hard card, but it was originally in a thick metal bracket that I had to remove to even install it in a non-8-bit slot. I didn't have high hopes for this because hard cards were pretty much junk when new, and finding a working one is basically impossible. As for this one, well... Okay, I think it's in there. All right, screwdriver. YOLO! Wow! That sounds like the data going to heaven. Should I turn it off or should we... Nope, let it run. Yeah, I think it's safe to say that this is trashed. The controller did get registered, but otherwise I couldn't get any signs of life out of it. Cyrusel took the hard card since he thought that he might be able to resurrect it, and then left the rest of the portable with me. During the little hackathon we did with the hard card, I was convinced to do a YOLO smoke test on the portable. This perhaps wasn't the wisest course of action, but I know for a fact that the PSUs on these have both overvoltage and short circuit protection. I was probably tempting fate though in thinking, what's the worst that could possibly happen? Three, two, one. Contact! Wow, that's signs of life. Signs of life. Although Holy the red shit. the red LED did not come on. No LED. And I didn't hear high voltage. 
That may it may not initialize the high voltage without the CGA card. Yeah. Okay. So that may be an, that may be an AC pin. But though. No red light. No red light. Flipping the power switch caused the fan to start and the power LED on the mainboard to blink, but otherwise it was dead. That is typical of short circuit protection kicking in. Cyrocell and I did a little bit of debugging and I found that at least one capacitor was shorted, but as it was late, we put the system back together and I let this sit until the following day. After getting a good night's rest, it was time to work on this properly. To their credit, Compaq made these things relatively accessible, but it's still not the easiest case design to work with. One neat aspect of this design is that pieces of the metalwork literally just slide out without having to fully remove the screws. We can see this aspect with the ISA card cover. I had to use pliers to remove a locking screw, but afterward it simply slides out of place. With the ISA slots now reachable, we can start pulling cards. The first thing out is this authentic haze modem, and whoa, what a beautiful thing it is. I legitimately want to use this for something, if only for the fact that it's a haze modem, but I'll set it aside before I start drooling. Next up is Compaq's VDU board, which was their answer to IBM's color graphics adapter. While the portable as a whole is filled with tantalum capacitors, the VDU in general is notorious for simply shorting out the ISA bus as more than one RetroTech YouTuber has found out. We'll be able to test if the voltage rails are shorted on it with a multimeter after fixing the main board. Another thing to note is that there are plastic guides for full length ISA cards which have either fallen off or gone stuck. I have all these spacers, but any repair will likely involve super gluing them back in place. They're not strictly necessary, but without the guides, the full length cards can flex, so this is something I do want to fix further down the line. Finally, rounding out the set is the floppy controller card. It's at this point that I wanted to see if the PSU was even functioning. The easiest way to do this is to remove the main system board and then measure the voltages at one of the Molex connectors. If the main board wasn't even getting power, then I had a bigger problem than a shorted voltage rail. However, getting the main board out is not entirely easy. With all the ISA cards removed, the system can be rotated to the other side where this plastic cover can be popped off. Afterwards, this metal plate can be loosened and the PSU interface PC speaker cable, and keyboard connector can be disconnected with some effort. Afterwards, the board can be slotted out with some difficulty. With the logic board out of the case, I can reconfirm my findings from the other night. With a multimeter, the 12 volt rail is reading as a direct short to ground. I also found through some testing that the tantalum capacitor at C81 appears to be a dead short. It's likely that the short protection in the PSU is preventing C81 from simply blowing out. I do have replacement capacitors on hand, but we'll come back to this. For one, I want to know if the PSU even had signs of life, since it would affect where I take this project. To be frank, a dead PSU could stop any attempted revival in its tracks, so I want to know how deep this rabbit hole went before I invested a lot of time in it. Without the main board, I figured the easiest and most reliable way to test this was to hook up the multimeter at the Molex connectors where I could easily test the positive 5 and 12 volt rails. I left one of the disk drives connected to provide a dummy load and then flipped the switch. Smoke test, three, two, one. Okay, that was a bit anticlimactic. We get a brief burst of power and then nothing. That meant that the over voltage or short circuit protection circuits were kicking in. At this point, I would have liked to remove the PSU to inspect it, and I'll just let past me explain why I didn't immediately do so. Okay, I don't know how well this is showing up on camera. So we've got the CRT here. Uh, there's the heater. I don't see. Okay, so the anode cap is down there. If I need to discharge it, it should be discharged, but. Uh, you know, safety first. Um, the PSU is here, it's unshielded. I need to figure out how you get that out. That does not look trivial to remove. I guess it must lift straight out. 
It's the only way it could possibly come out. Okay, I don't know how well this is showing up, but there is a nut down there. You can just barely see it where my finger is. That has to come out. That's apparently a spring-loaded nut, according to the service manual. And, um, yeah, I don't know how I'm going to do that. I don't have a socket wrench that could fit in there. Okay, let me think about this. Just as an additional aside, the actual compact service manual notes that there seems to have been a special PSU removal tool just for this situation. At this point, I wasn't sure how I was going to get the PSU out, so I decided to keep removing components. If I could at least find something that changed the PSU behavior, then I knew it was a component that I had to inspect further. The floppy drives are another point which could introduce a short, so I decided to disconnect both entirely. I then plugged in a known good drive to serve as a dummy load and went for a third smoke test. Three, two, one. Well, nothing changed. This is getting concerning now since I'm down to the CRT and the PSU itself. I was concerned how the CRT was connected to the power supply, so I decided to go with the nuclear option and just remove the entire thing. This would also let me get to the PSU board through the side. That being said, removing the CRT is slightly easier said than done. While there are screws on the top and bottom of the compact that hold the screen in, several of these screws are located on the side within the PSU compartment. To gain access to these, I had to remove the IEC socket, and just to add that final insult to injury, I had to use my pliers and more than a little elbow grease to get that bottom screw to move as it was essentially frozen in place. Even with the screw out, I still couldn't remove the CRT housing. As it turns out, the PC speaker for the compact is mounted in the CRT cage and the speaker wire was zip tied in such a way that it was holding the whole thing down. The zip tie was so awkwardly placed and difficult to reach that I legitimately thought I was going to slice for the power supply cables and trying to cut it, but I eventually succeeded. After getting the power connector through the grommet at the bottom of the case, the CRT finally came out. Before going any further, it was time to test the PSU yet again, and once more I used a known good floppy drive as a dummy load with the multimeter connected on the Molex connectors. Three, two, one. In what's becoming a rather predictable result, we once again get a burst of power and then nothing. <sighs> you guessed it, faulty power supply unit. Honestly, at this point, I was wondering if this system was even salvageable. While I do know quite a bit of the theory of switching power supplies, the honest truth is I do not have the tools or expertise to properly service one of these, so unless it's a really obvious fault, I was going to be out of luck. With the CRT out though, I could finally release the bolt that held the PSU board in place, slide it out, and get my first look, and whoa, this isn't good. Right off the bat, I can see discoloration on several caps, and from the layout of the PSU board, this is not going to be easy to work on to say the least. Interestingly, I don't actually see any leaked electrolyte, nor do I smell the distinctive odor of failed capacitors. It was at this point that I knew I needed help, so I reached out to a few people who know more about computer necromancy than I do, and someone who had actually worked on a compact portable and began brainstorming. I also went on one of my research benders and slowly, the pieces of this puzzle began to slot into place. While doing so, I was able to find a schematic of the compact portable from Sam's for $22. I also stumbled across EEV Blog's recent compact portable series which gave me hope that I might still be able to get this system running. In normal operation, this PSU provides 4 voltages, positive 5 volts, positive 12 volts, negative 5 volts, and negative 12 volts. There's also a special line called Power Good or PG. The PG line is generated by a special circuit that basically determines if the PSU is generating all four line voltages properly and is used to start the CPU clock to bring the system out of reset. As best I could tell, an undervolted rail would not cause the behavior I was seeing. 
Instead, what's happening here is that something is running over voltage. I will try to explain this failure mode, but I will note that I am not an electrical engineer and I don't have a lot of experience with analog circuits. As such, in the likely event that I got this wrong, please let me know in the comments. With that said, let's get to it. In this schematic, there's a failsafe circuit called Q4, which is essentially a circuit breaker. If the voltage lines go too high, the Q4 circuit stops the switch part of the switching power supply and shuts down the PSU. This would manifest as a momentary surge of power and then the voltage rails dying. It also seems like this failsafe could be tripped by not having enough load on the voltage rails. To that end, it was suggested to me that I run the PSU with just the main circuit board installed to provide a load on all four rails. To be honest, I was skeptical that this would accomplish anything, mostly because EEV Blog appeared to be running his portables PSU with the system board removed, but I also had nothing to lose by trying it. We knew that the failsafe circuit was working, so I wasn't super concerned with frying the main system board. However, to even attempt this, I had to clear the short circuit on the negative 12 volt rail. To do this, the C81 capacitor had to come out. Now, it's at this point that I should note that I am not exactly an experienced solderer, and this is also the first time I've ever tried to do component replacement. Still, nothing ventured, nothing gained. I applied a good heap of flux to the board, got the iron, and tried to desolder the component without doing any damage. This was easier said than done, but after several false attempts and fighting my own nerves, I eventually managed to get C81 off the board. The capacitor registered as a dead short out of circuit which confirmed my earlier testing. From the markings, it's a 10 microfarad capacitor RAID for 16 volts, which is a standard part, and I had a perfect replacement on hand. Getting the new part in was a bit tricky, but in the end I did succeed. I also confirmed that I had continuity from the negative 12 volt pin to the new C81, so I guess we're ready to try this. What? Okay, I won't lie here, I'm kinda shocked that it's working. The honest truth is that I originally tested the PSU again after removing C81 and it had shown the same behavior without the capacitor installed. A burst of power and then nothing. I had discussed this with others and the general opinion was that having C81 missing should not have tripped the protection circuit. To that end, I actually just ordered the parts to replace the PSU off eBay and Amazon with the intent of jury rigging a modern replacement. However, after writing this script and recording the voiceover for this video, I realized that I still need the test with the replacement capacitor installed. Since I always try to document these things as accurately as I can, I got the camera out to get a bit of B-roll footage, and well, here we are. Since this would be an anticlimactic stopping point, let's keep going. To help me see if the PSU was behaving, I installed a diagnostic postcard in one of the ISA slots. XT class machines don't emit postcodes, but I can see if the ISA bus is alive. From the LEDs, we can see that there are at least some signs of life to be had. The next step would be to re-add components one by one until I've either reassembled the portable or something else breaks. Since the portable doesn't have onboard graphics, the next port of call would be to plug in the VDU adapter. Doing so, however, proved that we weren't quite out of the woods just yet. With the VDU installed, the power supply was once again turning off. Now, I know I said earlier in the video that the VDU adapter was prone to capacitor failure, but in this case, it wasn't quite that simple. For one, I couldn't find a direct short to ground by testing the ISA pins with a multimeter. I also couldn't find such a short by testing the capacitors in circuit with either my multimeter or an LCR meter. To complicate matters, the SAM schematic for the VDU did not match my physical card, which meant that I was flying blind. My guess is that one of the capacitors was likely failing, but it wasn't a full open short. That meant that finding the problem would likely require removing components at random until the problem went away. Furthermore, despite my initial successes, I also didn't know for sure that the original PSU was good. It was possible that it was having issues due to additional load. The best way to determine this would be to try the VDU card in my 4A6 or to swap the PSU. 
At this point, the ATX PSU adapter board had arrived, so I had a decision to make. After a lot of debate and even more hesitation, I decided to try a replacement power supply on the basis that I was only risking a non-working system. I also felt that putting what is essentially a clone CGA card in Lovecraft's 486 seemed like it could be best described as a bad idea. This of course means that we'll probably try it in a later video. The ATX adapter board arrived mostly assembled, although it came with two capacitors of unknown purpose. They don't seem to be necessary and the instructions don't mention them, so I left them uninstalled for now. However, the underside of the board had exposed pins and this looked like an accident waiting to happen, so I used electrical tape to create an insulating layer. Afterwards, it was just a matter to plug in the modern ATX power supply and see if the main board itself would turn on. Three, two, one. Well, no smoke so far. Time to put the VDU in and see what happens. Okay, three, two, one. Oh! Okay, that was a bit more explosive than I was expecting, but at least we found the fault. Taking the VDU out of the compact, it was time to inspect the damage. We can clearly see that a tantalum capacitor has blown right next to this pin header. Upon a deeper examination, I noticed that one of the traces on the back of the card had actually burned. I did follow it with a multimeter and the trace itself is still registering continuity, but I'll run a modulator for it anyway. So the question is now, what exactly did that capacitor do? Well, as it turns out, it's not something we actually need. It appears to be a filter capacitor for the CGA light pen header. I'll replace it as a matter of course, but for the moment, I can leave it as is. The win here is that I can actually power the system up with the VDU installed and the postcard is showing that we're at least getting power. The thing I wanted to know was, is the portable even doing anything? Ideally, I could have just plugged in an external display, but I don't have an RGB capable monitor, nor do I have something like an MCE to VGA adapter. However, CGA cards do have a composite jack and I do have a retro tank. By flipping the system dip switches to 40 columns mode, I can tell the system to enable the composite output. Now it was the moment of truth. <laughs> Look at that. It's working. Well, that's progress to say the least. We're still a long way from a functional system, but we're definitely moving in the right direction. However, I still have quite a bit more to do before we could potentially boot into DAWs. I also need to figure out what I'm going to do about the power supply. I will go more into this in the next part, but I am strongly leaning towards staying with the ATX style PSU. However, in doing so, we might have to make some modifications down the road relating to the negative 5 volt rail, as well as figuring out how to install it in the case. Let me know your thoughts below since it'll definitely influence how this project goes. It's on that note that if you enjoyed this content, leave a like and please subscribe. If you really liked this content, consider supporting me on Patreon or at least clicking that bell. These projects take a lot of time and effort, so all your support is greatly appreciated. Until the next time, this is N Commander, signing off, and as always, wishing you all a pleasant day.